Well, hi there. As you may know, at the end of 2019, I went to Australia for a day and to the island of Niue. We have videos about both of those amazing places. But you can only get to the island of Niue from New Zealand. And that is actually where I spent most of my time on this trip. Australia, again, was just a one-day layover on our way to New Zealand. And New Zealand is one of the most interesting places on planet Earth. And one of the most interesting things about it is that it has no native mammals except for bats and marine mammals. Essentially, no mammals that couldn't fly or swim across the ocean made it to New Zealand. And this means that the niches that are generally filled by mammals are filled by something else. Something that isn't a mammal, such as this creature. This nocturnal creature is a kiwi. They're some of my favorite animals on the planet. And until this trip, I'd never seen one in my life. I'd been to places that had them, but I'd never had the privilege of actually seeing one before. I even had to go to more than one place that had them in New Zealand before I saw my first. This is such an odd bird. They are ratites, which are generally large flightless birds like cassowaries, ostriches, rheas, and these Australian emus. Before humans arrived in New Zealand and hunted them into extinction, there was a large wingless bird called a moa. This was thought to be the closest relative of the kiwi, but DNA studies have revealed that their closest known relatives were the elephant birds from Madagascar. And they're more closely related to Australian ratites like emus and cassowaries than they are to the moas. But they are weird ratites. In fact, they're just straight up strange birds. They're not small birds, but they're pretty small compared to other ratites. But they lay absolutely ginormous eggs. And unlike other ratites, they have big brains like parrots. They do have wings, but they're so small that they cannot be seen through the feathers. And while most nocturnal birds have huge eyes so that they can see well in the dark, kiwis have the smallest eyes for their size of any bird. In fact, vision appears to be so unimportant for these birds that entirely blind individuals seem to do just as well as sighted individuals. And the reality is that there's evidence that they're only nocturnal due to pressure from introduced predators like humans. In areas where the introduced predators have been removed, they're frequently seen out during the day. I'm already planning my next trip to see that. Birds generally see very well and smell very poorly. Well, kiwis are weird. We already know that they don't see well. But also, they have a fantastic sense of smell. And they have nostrils located at the end of their beaks. You see, kiwis are essentially bird shrews. They sniff around for worms and whatnot, and then grab them with their long and highly touch-sensitive beaks. I know that I say that a lot of animals are among my favorites. And this is true, I love basically everything. But kiwis are on a short list of animals that fill me with warm fuzzies whenever I think about them. I could talk about them all day, but then when would I talk about these amazing green geckos? Because these are some of the strangest and most beautiful of all geckos. These geckos are only found in New Zealand. These guys and the day geckos of Madagascar are the only green geckos of which I'm aware. And not only are these guys and day geckos both from large islands, and commonly green where other geckos are not, they are also both diurnal. But they're weirder than even the day geckos, because while most geckos, including day geckos, lay eggs, these guys are ovoviviparous, meaning they incubate their eggs internally and give birth to live offspring. They're weird, they're beautiful, and they're only found here. And the same is also true of this bird, the kia. The kia is pretty obviously a parrot, and it looks pretty much like a normal big parrot. That beak might be a bit sharper and more hooked, though, and it seems pretty at home on the ground. And it is, because it is the only parrot in the world that lives above the tree line. These are alpine parrots. As such, they don't eat a typical parrot diet. 
Instead, they feed on things like roots, leaves, insects, other birds, invasive mammals, and carrion. And they're smart. Crazy smart. They often work together to perform tasks required to get food. But more amazingly, they've been observed making and then using tools. They're like alpine orcas crossed with chimpanzees that happen to be parrots. And then there is this amazing creature. This is a tuatara. Before this trip, I had never seen a tuatara. They're only found here in New Zealand. And at first glance, they look pretty much like a cool looking lizard, but they aren't lizards. They are the only remaining species of the lineage of reptiles called the Rhynchocephalia. This is an ancient order that was hugely successful at the time of the dinosaurs, but they're not dinosaurs. Dinosaur is not the name for all ancient reptiles. Dinosaurs are a distinct group of ancient reptiles. The only existing lineage of dinosaurs alive today are the birds. But the order Rhynchocephalia did thrive alongside the dinosaurs. Today, most of the niches once occupied by Rhynchocephalians are occupied by their closest living relatives, the squamate reptiles, like lizards and snakes. Together, the Rhynchocephalians and the squamates comprise the clade Lepidosauria, whereas the crocodilians, birds, and probably turtles are in the clade Archosauria. So anyway, these amazing creatures are not lizards, but they are closely related. So what's the difference? Well, let's start at the penis, or penises in the case of the Lepidosaurs. Whereas lizards have well-developed hemipenes, tuataras do not. They have some outpocketing of the cloacal wall that are considered to be the precursors to hemipenes, but proper hemipenes they are not. Now let's move to the noggin, because there's a lot that is odd about that noggin. For starters, their teeth, their front teeth form kind of sort of a beak. And then they have two rows on the top and one on the bottom that fits right between the top rows to really slice through the exoskeletons of insects and the bones of vertebrates like butter. And then there's their notorious third eye. Yes, you heard that right. And it totally is an eye. That said, third eyes are actually pretty darn common in the Lepidosaurs, as well as amphibians, sharks, and bony fishes. Heck, lampreys and a few other groups have two of these extra eyes, so I'm really not sure why it is so often discussed in the Tuatara, but it is, and that's fine. So what is it? Well, it's an eye, sort of. It's an eye in that it detects light and transmits information about light to the brain. It even has a little lens, but it doesn't have the same visual acuity or function as the two more conspicuous eyes. It's really only visible in juvenile tuataras, as it is covered in skin, which soon becomes too opaque to see the eye clearly. This third eye, called the parietal eye, is an outpocket of the pineal gland in the brain. This is the gland that produces melatonin, which is the hormone that regulates your sleep and seasonal cycles. So it probably isn't too surprising that it could use some information about when it is light and when it isn't. When it is light versus when it is dark can be essential in determining when to be awake and when to be asleep. If you get that wrong, you probably don't live too long. And information about how long it is light versus how long it is dark can be essential to correctly timing major events like reproduction and brumation. You get that wrong, you or your offspring just might not make it. So the pineal gland gets information from the parietal eye to set the daily, circadian, and yearly, circannual rhythms for the animal. You have a pineal gland as well, but it gets information through your eyes. This is why the circadian rhythms of people that are totally blind are often quite irregular. Same thing goes for people that spend extended times down in caves. And last but not least, these guys are a fantastic example of the diapsid condition. The lepidosaurs and the archosaurs together are part of a clade called the diapsid reptiles. And diapsid refers to the number of holes in the skull behind the eye called temporal fenestrae. Diapsids have two of these temporal fenestrae behind their eyes. And the tuatara skull is about the most perfect example of the diapsid condition that there is. I mean, look at the size of these fenestrae. 
And this is really cool because a lot of the extant diapsids do not show off the diapsid condition nearly as well. For example, lizards like these Australian lace monitors or these amazing skinks and geckos from New Zealand are missing the bottom bar on the lower hole called the jugal arch. This is one of the best ways to distinguish a lizard from the other lepidosaurs. The bottom hole on lizard skulls is open on the bottom. So they have one hole and one lowercase n. But they're still diapsids. And that gets us through the lepidosaurs. They're a little bit weird. But the archosaurs are really weird. Crocodilians, like this alligator, have really clear but much smaller temporal fenestry. But turtles, like this Australian snake neck turtle, which is one of the side neck turtles that we discussed in this video, well, they're often referred to as being anapsid. Anapsid would mean that they don't have any temporal fenestra at all. And they don't. Sort of. Their ancestors did, but sort of like lizards, they're missing part of the skull that completes the hole. In this case, the backsides of the holes are open. So they don't have any fenestrae, but they do. And they're almost always classified as diapsids, even though they're often presented as living examples of anapsids. But you know who I have never heard referred to as an anapsid? Birds like the kiwi, the kia, and these amazing Australian emus. Or these Australian black cockatoos that were obsessed with Leisha. We'll show you that at the end, so stick around. But the thing about birds is that there are no fenestrae behind their eyes. At least it isn't obvious that there are. And yet I've never heard anyone use them as an example of the anapsid condition. They're always just called diapsids and nobody seems to bat an eye. Now their ancestors, feathered theropod dinosaurs, were pretty clearly diapsids. But what happened to those holes? Well, I finally found out. They were incorporated into the orbit to give them a ginormous eye socket. That's stinking rad. So those are our living diapsids. There are also some living animals today with only one hole, the synapsids. These include animals like this Australian wallaby, this ringtail lemur from Madagascar, or this human with a bird on her head. And we better show you a little bit more of that. Thank you for joining me to check out some of the amazing things I saw in New Zealand. Thank you to our supporters at Patreon for making this possible. If you'd like to see me go to more amazing places like this in the future, or just see the cool features that we have available to our patrons, please consider checking out our Patreon. I could talk about them all day, but then would... I could talk about them all day, but then when would... Blah, 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 blah. I could talk about them all day, but then would I... Blah, 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 blah. This is a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> don't poop on me. Don't let him poop on me, okay? I don't tell him what to do. <laughs> Have you found the perfect purge? Look at the Australian water dragon! <laughs> it's a big one! Oh, yeah. That's a big boy. Hey, dude. You're doing great. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Okay. Stay. Stay. <laughs> <laughs> this gives a new meaning to the word bird's nest hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>